You are our first podcast, but we have a golden rule to start the podcast off well. Mm. Would you please touch my ball? <laughs> That's right. So we get all the right uh, energy. Both hands around yes, yes, you see. Now, now you've got That's the good, good zap, so <laughs> luck be with you. <laughs> We've got Nigel Morris, the solo guru of 30 years with us today. With 30 years of industry knowledge, there'd be hardly anybody we could uh, invite that still remembers that far back. <laughs> and you're one of the few people. Well, that's, well, they're crazy to be in it for 30 years. That's right. right that's right. <laughs> well, they're that old that they can't remember, but you seem to still remember. I've heard a few stories. Mm. So uh, tell me, how did you actually start in solo? I mean, one day you, you wouldn't have just thought, I'll start with Sola because Sola wasn't really not in existence. I'll try and keep this as short as I can, but I do have a story because when I was 18, I was traveling through Europe. I bought a combi, went over there with my girlfriend, drove around Europe as you do. We are driving around Europe. We um, were in Germany, actually, and uh, we were living off bread and cheese and a few vegetables, as you do when, you, when you're uh, trying to do it cheap. And we went into a fruit and vegetable store to buy some tomatoes. And uh, there, were, there were tomatoes that had a nuclear radiation symbol on them. And we kind of, I don't speak German, I know you do, but I don't speak German. And we sort of eventually interpreted that some of these tomatoes may have been affected by Chernobyl. The explosion at Chernobyl had happened not long they before were a bit we cheaper. got there. They were much cheaper. So eventually we found someone who said, is spent, uh, who could speak English, and they said, look, we have the normal tomatoes and we have these ones. They might have been radiated, but they're cheap. And, and to be honest, that is the first time I ever thought about the implications of turning a light on. It had, it had never, ever occurred to me until I had to contemplate whether I was going to eat a poisonous tomato. And it got me on this long journey of thinking about, you know, the impact of energy. And But how did you then end up somewhere in Australia in a job in the solar industry? Yeah. So, um, uh, again, the short version is a buddy had moved to the north coast of New South Wales. We we're having a farewell party. Uh, it was late. We, we sat down to eat the final bit of pizza watching TV. And there was a story on TV about a bunch of hippies in Nimbin who'd set up a solar company. And they were building this big factory and, you know, they needed a quality assurance manager. And at, the, at that time, I was a quality assurance manager in an automotive plant doing manufacturing of cars. And uh, I always kind of had this niggling problem coming back to the energy thing about that I was part of the problem. Uh, I was creating more problems every time I helped build a car. And we, we were joking about it. He said, there you go. I'm, I'm moving up the North Coast. You could move up there. Got a young daughter. Your family's from up that way. And so I applied. And uh, I sent him a letter and they said, sure, when can you start? And so I went up and, and, and checked them out and um, they were indeed a bunch of hippies from Nimbin, but they were pioneers in the industry. What, was that? The Rainbow Power. Of right, course, right. in Nimbin, why wouldn't you call yourself Rainbow Power? Rainbow Power Company at number one alternative way. <laughs> that was their street, which they, they built the street, they named it, and they're still there today all these years, like nearly 40 years, I think. Uh, so they were real pioneers. And, and so for me, uh, moving up there, apart from, you know, getting to live in a beautiful part of the world, um, our house was run on hydropower and a little tiny solar system, and we sold uh, wind, solar, microhydro, coconut-powered biomass machines, you name it, we did it all around Southeast Asia and... And, and northern New South Wales and, and, and way beyond. So that was my introduction. You ended up at uh, BP Solar at one stage. That's when I met you first time. So how did you do that transition and what was that like from a, from a rainbow power to a big multinational? Yeah, that was a really interesting one, actually, because, you know, um, sort of being a long way away from corporate Sydney and, 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 and BP, you know, the issues around um, ethics uh, and, and who was making solar technology and were they holding the technology back, which was a big rumour, you know, that the reason the big corporates were getting into solar solar was so they could they could compress it and stop it from happening and I, I, um, I actually went to an event in Sydney on behalf of Rainbow Power um, and uh, at that event I met a BP um, solar uh, guy, one of the senior sales guys, uh, Richard Collins and um, 
I chatted to Richard about this and, and he, he laughed and he said, mate, we, we, we've got more staff in BP Solar in Australia than BP has staff. That's an indication of how seriously they're taking it. And, and if you'd like to learn more, I'd like to tell you about the investments we're going to make and the new factories we're going to build and everything else. One thing led to another and he offered me a role. And um, as I had often thought about before, rather than listening to rumor or gossip, I thought if there is a chance that this company is doing the wrong thing, the best way to influence it is from the inside. So I'm going to go give it a go. And in my farewell speech to, to, to my great friends at Rainbow Power, I said, if, the, if this is a scam, if, it's, if they are really holding the technology back, I'm coming back. <laughs> right? So don't, don't, don't throw my chair out. I'll come back if it's a scam. If it's not a scam, I'm going to go down there. I'm going to help do what I can and work for them. And I really wanted to go more upstream and learn more about the technology. Mm -hmm. So it was a great opportunity. So were uh, BP Solar making the cells in Australia and the frames and the glass and it all was put together or was it just an assembly? How did it actually work? So when I started, we had a facility in Brookvale here in Sydney, a very small facility in global terms now, but it was actually doing all the cell processing. Um, we didn't have a wafering facility, mm -hmm. but all the everything from the raw wafer forwards was done. Um, it was a very basic, very simple, old school, small operation like all of them. It, it was in fact formerly owned by Tideland, who were one of the very first solar companies in, in the world who originally built navigation lights. So we did We'd taken it over from them through BP's connections with Lucas Energy back in the UK, which are another big founding company. We were there for a number of years, and then um, um, uh, in the late 90s, we merged uh, – BP and Amico merged their solar companies, which was BP Solar and SolarX. They were merged, and we then moved to Sydney Olympic Park. SolarX had a factory in Villawood. BP Solar had one in Brookvale. We merged them and built a, a whole new facility which at that time was actually one of the biggest solar manufacturing facilities in the world um, and certainly the biggest in the Southern Hemisphere. And, and we had a state-of-the-art line right in the middle of Olympic Park. And I think you did about, about 50 megawatt a year or something like that? Yeah, at its peak, it was something like that. We were actually exporting solar panels out of Australia. Mm, um, mm. So we supplied different divisions with different products and every factory we had around the world, and I was lucky I used to go on a global trip and visit every one of our plants in all the – Barcelona, uh, uh, Germany, of course, uh, uh, India, America, um, a whole bunch of places. And, and, and we all had specialties in different products and different technologies. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was a good plant. But if you say 50 megawatts, I mean, in Australia, uh, we <laughs> import every month quite a bit more than 50 megawatts nowadays. We so, do. So it's kind of quite amazing. You had 50 megawatts, you were exporting all around the world with that capacity. Yeah. And nowadays we bring in at least 1,000 megawatts, sometimes 1,500, 2,000 megawatts a year into the country now. That's right. So it, it actually, in global terms now, it would be just a very small minion factory. Tiny, tiny, not even viable. In fact, you couldn't even you couldn't viably produce a solar panel in a factory that small now. Right, right. You just wouldn't. It wouldn't be. It wouldn't be a big enough scale. So, so what did the panel cost under BP at those days? Uh, uh, at its peak, and I was digging out a price this the other day. I think we we're around eleven dollars a watt. Right. Uh, today, uh, wholesale, uh, the solar panels about forty cents a watt. Right, right. So from eleven dollars, the pricing has come down to forty because That's of capacity right. increases. At Etc. Yep. Um, but BP Solo is not around anymore. What happened? No, that's a that's a really good question. It 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 um, it ended about three or four years after I left, so I wasn't there during that time. But there were a number of changes in senior management, and and of course, right up that's right up at corporate in BP headquarters, and and we had had a senior um, chairman who very very enthusiastically drove the solar agenda. He was out of the picture. Uh, and we had a couple of other changes of leadership that meant that it was getting tricky at first time, firstly, to get to get the sort of high level corporate support. Secondly, you know, there's an old saying that says you can be so early to the parade that you miss the party. 
And I think that was sort of a bit what happened with BP. They were so early in. I mean, when they finished, they'd been going for more than 30 years. So they'd been so early in that there was not a lot of money to be made, even though the prices were high. There wasn't very much money. There wasn't very much scale. And they had invested literally billions and billions and billions of dollars for 30 odd years. So the second part of it was they just ran out of steam for continuously making these investments. Around the same time, two other crucial things happened. Well, number one, China started to emerge as, and they previously had no manufacturing capacity, whatever, whatsoever. They emerged, and at the same time, when when they emerged, they had all this new technology. They had new equipment for manufacturing. Ours was all five, six, seven, eight years old in some cases, and that's old in solar terms. Very old, very old. It, it changes dramatically and there were a lot of changes happening in the equipment around that time as well. So they suddenly had machines that were better, faster, cheaper, and, and they could build solar factories much faster than we could. Secondly, the price of silicon had been uh, very high, hundreds of dollars a kilo previously. And so we, at BP Solar, we had entered long-term contracts, which we thought was a bargain, at, you know, maybe $140, $120 mm-hmm. a kilo or something like that price of silicon plummeted to you know 30 or 40 dollars a kilo and we were locked into all these contracts with very very high price silicon you put all those factors together and the fact that their oil rig in the gulf of mexico created one of the biggest disasters uh, ever and their credentials were in trouble the senior leadership wasn't super enthusiastic they'd poured billions in already and they had all this expensive silicon and old factories so they pushed it off a cliff so we really lost that export earning for australia where we made something here and china got replaced it and now would you agree that how many percentage of panels come to australia would be made in china 99 (laughs) percent 99 percent yeah yeah, wow. I would say 99, wow. yeah. Is there some local capacity still available? There is. There is one factory that is a genuine factory down in Adelaide, which has been actually there for some time and it's actually recently been completely renovated and um, I don't even know what their capacity is. I, th- I think it might be um, up to 120 or 150 megawatts. So, again, not huge. It's really there to serve the local market in a, as a niche product. Mm. Um, but a wonderful facility. I've been down there and actually the launch uh, there, their, their official launch is in You're allowed to say that only name. a few weeks, Tindo Solar. Um, and, um, you know, full credit to Adrian Ferrado, who, who started, had the vision to build another solar factory after the BP Solar one closed. Mm-hmm. It's been sold on now. Glenn Morelli owns it now and has done a great job. So, um, yeah. And there's been a couple of other people trying to start up little facilities, but no one's actually got a, a, a genuine uh, facility, especially that can do um, wafer processing. Got it. Now, I started to meet you 2006, which is close to 20 years ago soon. And uh, we looked at that time at four megawatts of annual sales. Mm. And we looked at a 10% growth and we thought we'd be really excited about that. (laughs) And to put that into account, that's about 4,000 kilowatt and the average is what about a 10 kilowatt system. So it's it's actually enough to supply nowadays 400 homes with solar Australia-wide. So that was the size of the industry. Yeah, and we do 20, 25,000 a month now. 25,000 installed a month, yeah. that's right. Yeah. So um, just in a quick one, and it's a long journey in a quick one, you already said from $11 down to 40 cents per watt, so the price yeah. went down. But why is Australia such a solar wonderland? Oh, that's a really good question. I think it's traditionally been because our solar resource is so good on global on a global scale. That, you know, Australia is just blessed in sunshine. We all know that. Secondly, um, originally there was a lot of interest in solar because of the need, particularly for remote telecommunications. There was more solar in Telstra had the largest installed solar capacity in the in the world on the entire planet oh, wow. for quite a while because they had no choice. It was the only way they could bounce the signal for mobile phones around the country and indeed for landlines originally. So that was co- kind of what got it going. Um, and, and then because the returns were so good, because we've got so much solar energy, the market just took off on its own. Even though our energy prices weren't relatively high, the economics started to look good because you could generate so much energy so easily. 
Um, I always call uh, John Howard the Solar King. Oh. Because actually, in some way, I believe the liberals are responsible for the solar industry taking off. Hmm. Do you remember the $8,000 rebate? I certainly do. That's really when it took off. Yep. And who introduced that? Yeah, that was Howard. Yeah. Yeah, you're so, right. So it's actually ironic <laughs> that the first leg up for the solar industry was John Howard. Yep. And it was about a year or six months before an election. Yep. And I feel that he might have thought that there'd be some additional votes coming his way. Yeah, yeah. If you were sceptical, <laughs> you might see it as that. In fact, you can look back over time at almost every rebate scheme or feed-in tariff scheme or, you know, we have, we've had community programs in the Daintree in, in, in for, for remote areas, for Indigenous communities. Almost every single one has been driven by votes. So if votes are needed and solar is, you know, a nice tasty subject that they think they might get some votes or some voters who they might not have otherwise attracted because of their mm. horrendous policies, for example, uh, then they'd throw a scheme out. And so, yeah, you're right. You have to give the government credit um, on both sides, in fact, for introducing schemes maybe with different motivations, but they certainly help drive the market. Mm. Um, I don't know about the $8,000 rebate, which at that time was pretty well the most generous anywhere. Mm. It was stopped by Peter Garrett. Mm. Uh, do you know the story behind that? I heard the story why it stopped. <sighs> well, my understanding was because it got wrapped up in the controversy around the uh, injuries that happened in the pink bat scheme that were running parallel. So there was the solar scheme and the pink mm, bat scheme, mm. and tragically a number of people died there. And there were in, in the pink bats in the not pink in the bat solar, scheme. Yeah. That's right. And there was great concern that this terrific program had been rushed out, mm. and that they needed to wind it back until they worked out um, until they could be safe, sure that everyone was going to be safe. Till we have Peter Garrett confirm it, I'm not 100 percent <laughs> sure, but this is the story I heard. Like in any rebates, it attracts a whole lot of solar sharks. Yep. And in this particular case, uh, people worked out that if you lived in an old people's home, each room was considered a separate residence. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if you had 100 rooms, you would actually be able to qualify for 100 times the $8,000 rebate. Oh, really? And they went basically into old people's homes and signed the oldies up literally over lunch by the hundreds. And by the time this particular company, and they'd start installing a few, and it was all one single one, one and a half kilowatt systems, mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. in the place on the round, very inefficient, mm -hmm. but following within the guidelines. Mm -hmm. And they then went in a big truck from Sydney to Canberra and dropped the boxes off of 5,600 applications <gasps> in one go. Really? <laughs> The next day, Peter pulled the, pulled the remote oh, Really? Screen. That wouldn't surprise me. We saw, I mean, we have seen every kind of, we've seen the best and the worst in humanity in our industry, right? And the worst of it was this shark-like behavior to grab free money. If there's rebates, people come in, they find a way to work the scheme. I, that wouldn't surprise me at all. But talking about solar sharks, I mean, I know that you have always been pushing very much for quality and there are lots of local companies who've been around now for 10, 12, 15 years and yep. they have survived what we call the solar coaster with rebates yep. coming, going, feed-in tariffs changing and they are still battling on and have actually made a good business out of it. They mm. usually employ the people or they've got really reliable subcontractor. Yep. But then unfortunately there is a dark side of the industry mm. where basically companies put crap in mm -hmm. And then when it comes home to roost, they just close the company and start again and the poor end customers are stuck. Yeah. Um, have you found that that's happening? I mean, what's the kind of worst excesses that you've experienced? Oh, God, Where, which, which one to pick out of the thousands that have entered and exited? We, we've literally seen thousands of companies exit the industry over the 30 years I've been in. And there was a real spate of it between sort of – I don't know, 2005 and 2015, it was particularly grubby then because it was really starting to take off and the volumes and the revenues were starting to grow so much. So it became, it was just bees to the honeypot. Um, um, but how does it work? I mean, you, what, you advertise a really low price 
you get your customer to get the system. Yep. Is it a really good quality system? No, no. It is, there, there are a bunch of companies out there that do not absolutely clearly do do not care about the quality of, of the equipment that they're, they're selling or the quality of service. They're, they're, it's not a long-term proposition for, the, for the, some of those companies, sadly. It is a very, very short-term proposition. It's about getting as much revenue as they can, as quickly as they can, and then running. And they literally close the business down push it off a cliff and make it bankrupt so you've got no one to go back to and then just rename it. And sadly, uh, that uh, uh, still happens far too often. And it's some of the largest companies, isn't it? There was True Value Solar. At one stage, the largest company in Australia, backed yep. by a German company. So you yep. felt, and they were a really strong German company and they used that to kind of get the trust of the people. Yep. So I say to people nowadays, look, if, if, if the price is too low to be, it sounds so good to be true. Why be greedy? Why want a two-year payback when a quality system can give you a four-year payback? Yeah. I mean, that that's my thinking about well, it. You're exactly right. It's like buying a car, right? Mm. You can go and buy a, a super, super cheap car from a no-name manufacturer and, and hope that everything goes okay and maybe you saved a few dollars. But we all know that buying at the bottom end of the market really pays. And mm. solar is a, is a long-term investment. It's got better. It's you know, four or five years now. So, you know, but you, you, it also, you know, the reality is no one really wants to buy a solar system as cheap as it is and have to replace it in five mm, years mm, or, mm. Or, or three. No one wants that. Everyone wants to spend a reasonable amount of money to get a reasonable solution, to get the savings, and then not worry about it. That's what most people want. Even people who buy cheap, they don't, they don't want to have to swap it out in a few years. But I mean, the other issue is, I mean, didn't the rebate and isn't the rebate also coming to help with the CO2 abatement? Yes. And what do you do when the system dies after three years and you put it back in and it goes in the tip? It hasn't really done much for abatement, has it? It's done very little. Uh, and it causes a, a big problem in the measurement of, of our actual emissions reduction as well, because those systems have already been counted, if you mm. like. Mm. So, yeah, there are, there are all sorts of problems with it. There are all sorts of problems. Do you want me to tell you my favorite story? about Absolutely. the big The biggest shark I ever came across, I helped actually helped get him into jail. There was a guy called... Pa and I'm going to name him because he's in the public. His name is Pastor Steve. And he was a classic <laughs> grub. He was an absolute grub was it of a pa man. Was he a real pastor? No, he was a fraudulent pastor as well. Uh, he formed, uh, a, a, he was, oh, I forget the year, but he he jumped in around that time when everything was peaking in southern Queensland, raced around, the, learned about solar, raced around the neighbourhood saying, look, pay your deposit. I can get you a better rebate than anyone. If you pay me a deposit now, and he'd take a $500 or a, a $1,000 deposit, and he literally, scooped up tens of thousands of deposits, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, never even, he'd never even talked to a solar supplier. He had no intention of even talking to solar suppliers or ever deploying that gear, took all that money and then ran. And um, uh, I was connected up with a number of people who were ripped off by Pastor Steve. Um, we actually helped um, uh, provide a lot of evidence of where he was. There was a great community action to try and keep track of him. And we found him, the TV crews, a current affair, and all those guys got on to him. The police got on to him. We, we were furnishing evidence of all the different things. And he went to jail. And he was one of just a number of people who were just grubs, grubs. Hope you're enjoying jail, Pastor Steve. <laughs> He might be out by now <laughs> with, your, with your history. That's probably <laughs> 10 years ago. But So what's your key advice? I'm now looking at solar. Electricity prices are going up again. Yep. Maybe I got a one, one and a half kilowatt system. Yep. And now I'm looking at solar again. What do I do? I rip the old one off, keep it going. What, what should I look for? Should I get a battery as well? What's your mm. key advice? Yeah. It's, look, I get asked this question all the time by my friends. Number one, fill the roof. Right, fill your roof. If you're going to put solar on, don't fall into the trap of thinking, oh, I'll just do a little bit now and do some more later because I don't need it all and I'll only be exporting it. Forget that. Fill your roof up and just get it over and done with, right? Even if it's facing the wrong direction, you're still better off with solar panels facing south. Right. Because you're still going to generate energy. It'll do about 65% of north. So. That's right. Mm. That's right. It's still worth doing. So fill your roof, do it once, put as much as you can on, and you'll get a, bit, a little bit better economy of scale. Mm. That would be rule number one. Uh, rule number two, the more 
you, the more roof space you have, the larger that system is, then yes, you can start considering a battery. Now, whether you want to or now, or you want to wait a few years, doesn't particularly matter. Batteries are a little bit up in terms of pricing at the moment because supply and demand is tight. Uh, so I would probably say wait a few years before you throw a battery on. The economics are not so good. If you can afford it, go for your life. It's wonderful. I've got a batteries at home they're terrific they move my energy so i can use it at night generate it during the day move it at night they're wonderful but not everyone can afford the luxury of making that investment yet but electrify everything make your house as solar friendly and as large as you possibly can and then electrify everything in the house and just use that energy good advice i mean i would actually add to it if you down the track look at buying an eb then get your solar get your battery get your EV charger, maybe get your hot water out of a heat pump that yep. is then taking the excess. Yep. And if you start doing all that, your payback actually, which can be 10 years with a battery alone, actually comes back down to a respectable six years or so. I've done some calculations yep. because you've got all the savings from the petrol that now goes back into your payback. So if you buy, build a new house, make sure the architect puts a good solar roof on, not a higgledy pickledy one with 15 gables. Yep. And then get the whole package because then you can finance it as part of the mortgage and you're really not feeling it. Absolutely. Look, I mean, I've got an electric vehicle. I worked out the other day. I've, I've had electric vehicles for 10 years now. I've saved $30,000 just in petrol. Mm. over that 10 years, average about three grand a year. And uh, so, you know, to me, I've actually paid for my first and second electric vehicles now out of the savings that I got. So He's driving a motorbike just to get you an idea because $30,000 will not pay for two electric vehicles. It won't pay for two cars. <laughs> It'll pay for a couple of nice motorbikes. Right. Eh? Now, um, so we've talked about the solar sharks, but you couldn't actually stop your own family member to participate in the solar shark industry. <laughs> <laughs> Bless her, my eldest child, who's 31 now, um, has done all sorts of different jobs. She bounces around uh, between different jobs and has traveled a lot and try, willing to try all sorts of things. And she called me, she said, Dad, oh, you've always wanted me to get me to get me into solar and I've always resisted, but oh, I came across this job that was um, selling solar. Should I take the job? And I said, well, who's the company? And I kind of went, oh, maybe, maybe not. She said, look, I'll give it a try. And anyway, it turned out it was a door knock job and they literally gave her a couple of hours of training threw her in a beat up old car drove her out into the middle of nowhere out on the on the fringes of melbourne dumped her there with the script and said sell and that was that was the extent of it and um she lasted less than 24 hours actually she lasted longer than that because i said you can't quit because i want the intel so you gotta <laughs> you gotta ring me i want you to send me all those scripts all their price list tell me what they're saying tell me what they're doing so that i could do some checks on you know whether they were doing the wrong thing or not which mm. as it turned out they were so yeah that was a sad experience i mean my general advice is if you get door knockers and solo it's not a good mix have you ever heard of a really top quality system being installed through door knocking it's very rare there are i do know people i i know some people very well who do occasionally do door knocking who will sell you good a good system mm. but i would say it is the exception rather than the rule and i would not ever recommend anyone buy anything from someone who rocks up at your door if you want to buy something go out and find your suppliers do a little bit of research yourself and make the decision yourself without being f pressured at your door to buy mm. something mm. now as an old hippie from nimbin <laughs> uh, what's your verdict on the recycling of solar panels uh, what's my verdict? I think there's been enormous progress made, but there's an, there's a lot of work to be done, clearly. Um, and the number of solar panels that um, are, are sitting in waste uh, depots now that really do need to, can be recycled and should be recycled has grown to a point where now the, the, the industry can support uh, recycling. Um, but it comes at a cost. Um, and I've advocated, in fact, I've got a friend in the US who runs a solar panel recycling business and he has advocated forever and I completely agree that there should be a levy put on solar panels only needs to be, you know, one or two cents, tiny, tiny levy. Per watts. So we're talking, per watt. so we're right. talking about maybe four or five dollars per panel. That's right. 
A few dollars per panel. I, I worked for a manufacturer. That's nothing. That's right. It's nothing. So uh, putting a few dollars per solar panel on to create a fund to help get the recycling industry up and running is the only way it's happened around the other places in the world, particularly in the US. Mm-hmm. There is a levy like that. And uh, I, I think that that is long overdue and we're, we're, we're ready for it now. We need it now. I mean, you can recycle the aluminium frames. Yes, the glass, I suppose, on the surface, which is making up a large part, can be recycled. Correct. What about the inside, the cells and all of that? Yeah, they can get some of the um, – they can actually extract some of the raw materials. So there's, there's silver used in there. Uh, there's aluminium used in there. The silicon cells themselves, they can't. But there, there are a bunch of chemical processes that they can use to extract it. And they can do all sorts of things with those materials. But you're right. It's the aluminium and the glass that are the main ones they get out. Now, I would argue that you would probably need to recycle center close to most major cities because the cost really for shipping a panel from Queensland somewhere down to Adelaide mm. is just not making it worth it really mm-hmm. and then that's again more CO2 in the transport mm-hmm. so who should take that initiative federal government yeah I think it's a terrific federal government initiative and in fact there has been some noise about it recently mm. which is mm. great to see mm. I think you know like all industries the solar panel manufacturing industry needs to go through a, a, a little bit of an evolution to begin with to get the scale right, we'll probably only have one or two or three facilities nationwide. Mm. And that's probably okay because what I believe is happening, they're stockpiling in very large warehouses now the um, dead solar panels. They also have the opportunity, interestingly, and I read something about this the other day, uh, that they're actually checking them before they crush them and discovering that quite a number of them are still working fine. And so there is an opportunity for those to be um, upcycled into areas where they perhaps don't need the quality or that a secondhand product is fine. So there are, there's opportunity for upcycling as well. But if they warehouse them now, then they can ship them in bulk and they can keep those costs down. We're going to need some support like any new industry did, mm. like any all of the recycling industries need this kind of support for goodness sake this can't even recycle plastic in australia at the moment so i think we'll have to go through an evolution you're right we're going to need them scattered around for the for the time for in the near term i suspect we're going to end up with one or two big plants mm-hmm. now we recently had a new federal government do you expect any changes to the industry any upsides any downsides what's uh, it seems like evs are being pushed a little bit stronger what are your expectations of the new government I, I don't have any expectations of politicians, <laughs> as lovely as some of them are, Marcus. But I, I have very low expectations. But what I can tell you is two things. Number one, it is super exciting and so refreshing to at least have a government who acknowledges the wonderful contribution that renewable energy can play. And we have not had that had that for decades. We've literally had people in government telling us that renewables were a big problem. And uh, that's finally gone. Um, so that is wonderful. And we've seen all sorts of announcements coming out and all sorts of attempts to, to really address the issues that have been causing problems for our industry already. So that's really exciting. Um, secondly, what we, what we also know is that, you know, it's a great thing for our industry because like it or lump it, most solar owners do actually take notice of what the government says. And if the government's saying solar's bad, solar's bad, solar's bad, it slows, gives you a reason to doubt whether solar really makes good sense or electric vehicles for that matter. But you're referring to the previous government. I'm that? referring to the previous government. Mm. So we had a lot of that and now we have the opposite. We mm. actually have a government saying, actually, the electric vehicles are a good idea. Renewable energy is a good idea. And that gives confidence back, not only to consumers, but also to people in the industry who want to invest to build build a recycling plant or expand their solar business or whatever it is. So I think it's all upside from here. Do you think it's a really genuine attempt by the government or do you think the fact that all these teal independents have come in, the government is seeing that there is an interest in the wider public to have that issue addressed and so they're now kind of hearing the law of the land or do you think it's kind of like a genuine? I mean, how do you see the role of the teals to actually have and had an influence in the government t- making that turn? Oh, I, I, I think their influence is profound. Uh, definitely, uh, definitely they've had a big influence and they've got it back on the agenda and they've got the ability to influence the discussions and the debates now. Mm-hmm. So that's that's really powerful. I, uh, I think going back a few years, I would have said it was probably just political spin that we were seeing maybe with some of the major, uh, parties. major parties. But... The evidence is now so clear 
that renewables are cheap and, in fact, can be incredibly reliable. In fact, they can make the grid more reliable. I mean, we've just gone through weeks of issues in South Australia with this orchestrated wonderful symphony of all forms of renewable energy being expanded and contracted and storage made available and frequency control being done. The grid in South Australia would have gone to a system black. There would have been an entire state blacked out had it not been for the wonderful sophistication of modern renewable energy in that state, particularly the large batteries and the large generators. So So you're saying that the wind farms, the... um solar farms, the batteries, the backup and the coal fire all contributed in some kind of way to keep the grid up, is it? Correct. Because what was the what was the trigger that you're saying it had to go? So there was a big storm, some power lines went down, one of the interconnectors between South Australia and Victoria happened to be down as well. So the and there was very low demand. So it was a combination of of, of you have to think of any your energy system like an orchestra. You want a bit more bass or you want a bit more uh, 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 drums battery, battery. or battery or whatever. <laughs> it may be and they can literally ramp these things up and down in milliseconds um, to 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 keep the sound just right like an orchestra you know so you have to keep everything balanced and up sometimes down at others so it's a it's a matter of orchestration now i think in australia right now with the 3.3 million systems we still got possibly mm. up to a million systems where the si- system size is only up to three kilowatt maybe quite a few of the one and a Very half small. kilowatt yep um so these people are now still hearing the headlines of energy prices going up 40 50 percent mm. something like that mm-hmm. um What's your advice to somebody who has a small system like mm. that? What's the way forward? Yeah, it's, it's a really, it's a good question because it is kind of tricky. So I would say, firstly, if you can confirm that your existing small solar system is still working, is still safe and is performing well. So if you bought a really good quality system, um, then you could leave it. Just leave it be. Don't touch it. Um and, and just add a larger system around it. And that's a that's a really great way to take advantage of that good investment that was made with good quality equipment. It doesn't have to be thrown away by any means. It can still continue to operate for decades and decades and decades. My last solar system, I had secondhand solar panels that were 27 years old running my last solar system. So, uh, you know, perfectly feasible to leave it there. If it is not performing well, or um, there are safety issues with it, um, and get someone good to inspect it, then it may pay to take it out and upcycle it um, and simply just put a whole new system on. Okay. Well, I think that's good advice. Now, the CC and the Solar Council are basically the instruments that represent the industry, mm-hmm. um, and they have done so for 15 years. Personally, I feel that the recycling should have been addressed already 10 years ago because Mm -hmm. it it doesn't take Blind Freddy to work out that even a 10, 15, 25-year product one day needs to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then we're trying to leverage off the green credentials, but we're not really keeping our own house clean. Mm. How do you rate their performance? Um, We can turn the sound down and you can tell me the truth. (laughs) I would say both of them are imperfect, but they are both doing a, a great job. The, the, you know what I'm going to say? I'm going to say the people within both of those organizations are genuine. They want to do as much as they can. They want to do the best thing for the industry and for solar consumers. And they work their backsides off every single day. They come to work just like you or I do and work hard. To, to get those outcomes. So as imperfect as some of the outcomes might be or, um, you yeah, know, there maybe are some some programs or, or, or things that they've done over the years that might not have worked out the way we all wanted, um, I commend the effort. And have you ever thought of uh, going into politics? <laughs> no, no, that's the truth. That's the, no, I never go into politics. But I'm but, going to challenge but, you here now because okay, I noticed that some of the more solar sharky companies yeah. managed to penetrate the uh, energy retailer status program. I don't know. What, what's it called? The approved retailer program. The approved retailer program. Mm-hmm. So for anybody who doesn't know about it, you can actually join a program 
that on the surface means you have to have a higher level of consumer protection attached to it. And so it Correct. gives consumer feeling that if I deal with that company, I'm really going to get a good service. Mm-hmm. But I've had some of the Phoenix companies definitely joining that scheme mm-hmm. and therefore actually getting the approval tick and yeah. making them feel good yeah. when they're actually really having the trap open for the end customer. So in mm. some way, the organization has helped really to lure the end customer towards a company that maybe the end customer with the right amount of research would have found out not to touch them. I I agree with that. There have been cases of some companies who I question. And also, I, I've been an advisor on that to the approved solar retailer right. on the panel. I've mm. been the industry rep for many years. No longer the case. But uh, the best example that I can give of why, even though it's not a it's not a perfect program, and sometimes companies get through who you would maybe go, why did they get through? The most wonderful thing about that program is when someone signs up to be a, become an approved retailer. For example, in Victoria, if you want to get the solar rebate in Victoria, you must be an approved solar retailer. Got it. Now that's a kind of a monopoly situation, which sets the spidey senses tingling, but. Given that it's mandatory, if there is a complaint made, if there is evidence of a company doing the wrong thing, there is now a weapon to take the accreditation away from that company. Now, in the absence of the approved solar retailer program, you couldn't do that. There was nothing you could do. You, you, a consumer would have to take it to court and ASIC would have to get involved. The ACCC would have to get involved and it could take years and nothing would happen. Meantime, they're, they're still out there in the market. The ASR program, by contrast, could move very, very rapidly, could threaten to take away the company's livelihood and actually take them out of the market. And they, in fact, have taken a number of companies out of the market. So on that, I really, really like it. This is one of the reasons I was such a big supporter of it. Secondly, I personally witnessed a lot of instances of companies being um, told they are in breach of the program and those companies stepping up and saying, please tell us what we got wrong. Please tell us mm. how to change our behavior so we don't get that wrong because this is important. Our business is relying on this program. And there were genuine attempts to actually do the right thing and change their business behavior. So that program was, I have seen that change, that program change bad companies' behavior into better behavior and and there are very few programs that have ever achieved that so on those things alone i think it is a wonderful program and has a lot of merits imperfect yes but now the one group that's really missed out on the big solar benefit is uh, the rental people Yes. And in some ways, it's ironic. I mean, some people call solar middle-class welfare because it's usually people who have a house, so they're relatively wealthy in the first place, who then can take benefit of government rebates that if you're a renter, you haven't got the ability to do so. Well, that's crap. Well, you tell me then. What? What? Well, the truth is the- most renters today would not have a solar system on their roof and would feel that they're excluded in the program. So if you say I there's agree. a way forward... No, 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 no. I'm going to challenge the notion that it's the wealthy middle class that buy solar. Ah. Because we have uh, we have seen it, think about it this way. If you got tons of money and you live in Mossman or Vaucluse or somewhere, you got a multi-million dollar house and Can we pick Rose Bay, please? Rose Bay. Live somewhere <laughs> salubrious and, you know, do you care about how much your electricity bill? You don't care. You've got a you got three Ferraris, right? You don't care about the cost of energy. It is not predominantly the wealthy who buy solar. It is people who I said middle class. I didn't say middle class. Well, I didn't say high upper class. Well, this is the latte sipping set that you know Angus Taylor and our former idiot. Uh, uh, we we can't we, we don't say any names. We don't want to be sued. Yeah, thank you. I know. I think some people know who you're talking about. <laughs> The criticism that we was a latte sipping wealthy suburbanite who bought solar is just garbage. So I really want to challenge that. The majority of people who buy solar are middle to lower class, a lot of rural and regional Australians who are genuinely feeling the pain of, of energy. There's statistics up the wazoo that show that it is Aussie battlers and mums and dads who predominantly buy solar. So I just want to challenge that. You are right, though. Around 40% of homes are, are rented. I'm a renter. 
I, 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 and I have solar on my house, but I am a minority. I am an absolute minority. It is very difficult to get solar in a rental place. Not impossible. You can do like I did. You can talk to your landlord. You can say, could I install some solar? Would you be interested in making the investment or can I make the investment? And then we strike a simple deal so that if I move out at the end of the lease, you can buy the solar off me or I'll have it removed and I'll move it to the next house, which is what I did in my case. Right, right. But- um I'd say the government could possibly create a slightly improved rebate system that if you put a solar system on a rental property and you have to put on at least that deck together for in the next five years, it stays a rental property mm-hmm. and you then give the benefits on to the tenant, mm-hmm. you can write the cost off on your depreciation. Yep. You've got a happier tenant. Yep. Uh, you've helped with the cost of living. Yep. You've helped with the CO2 abatement. Yep. Um, there's lots of positives and your tenant possibly stay longer because I find I had a rental property. The time when it costs you is when the tenant moves out, you've got to repaint the walls and all that. Mm -hmm. They stay in there double the time. Mm -hmm. Those works are not required. Mm -hmm. So uh, you could actually have a benefit as a landlord too with less churn. Mm -hmm. Um, Why hasn't that been explored? I don't know why it has been. It's a really good question. I don't know. I know... The solar for rental market is a very tricky market. It is a difficult nut to crack, sadly. Um, uh, we, we've had a number of goes at it. And there are certainly the metering laws and regulations do not help us. So for a landlord to be able to monitor his own solar system and for the custom to, cust- for the tenant to be able to see what's going on, there are privacy issues that you have to be careful about there. There are metering requirements if a landlord wants to sell the energy to the tenant that gets very complicated and very expensive very quickly that could be solved right that could easily be solved but i mean you just all you do is you say okay the benefit from this solar system i mean you can work that out through monitoring is uh, per month um 120 dollars mm-hmm. i charge you 15 bucks more per week you get the 15 bucks advantage yep and i pay for the electricity yep as yep. long as the tenant doesn't use it like a free checkbook suddenly and is now going and burning it to hell, yeah. um, everybody would win. Everybody would win. You're right. You're right. And there, there are cases of it working. We've, we've done a number of trials and programs mm. with rentals mm. in various different uh, sectors. So it can work. The, I, 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 our experience was that the biggest complication is you're dealing with so many people right? You're dealing with an owner. Mm. And in fact, you're rarely dealing with the owner. You're more often dealing with an agent of an owner, Mm. or in fact, you're dealing with an investment company that works through an agent on behalf of an owner. Mm. So there's, there's two or three parties straight up that you've got to negotiate it with. Then there's the tenants and then there's possibly council or other parties that you've got to get involved. So you've got, you've got, it's, it's a complicated um, structure to get right. It's not impossible, Mm. But it's complicated. But, I mean, the roofs of Australia are filling up fast. Yes. And that is probably the one low-hanging fruit that is still available if you were able to crack that nut. If the government would Agreed. look at it as an issue Agreed. and then find a way to get some of that red tape out yep. to be able to facilitate and make that possible because everybody's talking about cost of living. Yep. You're already Your rents have gone up. Now your electricity has gone up. And... If I own the house, at least I can buy solar to kind of create an antidote. Yes. If I'm a renter, I'm just copping it now. Yep. Look, as a renter, I don't know what I would – I was lucky that I was able to get solar on and I would be screaming blue fits of murder and so desperate for this. So I think I've insulated myself from it a bit because I've been lucky and I've Mm. been able to work the landlord in a personal relationship. But I really, I'm with you, mate. I I think there's a massive opportunity and, um, you know, owning your own house is very difficult. It's so expensive in Australia now. So the number of people renting is, you know, going to go up. It's going to go up. So this is a bit of a message for Chris Bowen. Because uh, I would say a lot of renters are Labor voters. Who knows? Lock them in with uh, solar for renters. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Chris only lives a couple of streets away. I might knock on his door. Get him, get him. We should get him. Can you get him up here? (laughs) I don't know if Chris Bowen would uh, come to on this show because I actually worked for him once. I was his media advisor for a very short time. Um, And then uh, 
something happened. <laughs> 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 but uh, no, he's a he's a. I actually have good hope for the uh, renewable industry because he uh, he's going in it with passion. And he didn't know that much about it, and he's learning very fast. And I actually yep. really believe that that's a low-hanging fruit that the government should tackle together with the recycling. Uh, I think it would uh, bring improvements quite radically, and uh, it should have been done 10 years ago. Oh, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. All right. Well, look, um, lots of good knowledge about the industry, a little bit of a trip back into the memory lane and uh, to all the friends at uh, Rainbow Power, there, Nigel is still in the industry. You obviously didn't spoil it for him. So <laughs> thank you very much, Nigel. It was a pleasure to have you. Pleasure to be here. Want more Energy Answered? Visit yourenergyanswers.com for quality energy products, tools and calculators and find your quality local installers. Please support the channel by liking the video, hit that subscribe button and ring the bell and check out all our other videos. You're still here? I'll see you next time. Bye.